Welcome, everybody, to Falls Con Anywhere podcast, first edition of 2022. My name is Charlie Turner here with Chris Carlo. Chris, first and foremost, man, Happy New Year to you, brother. Was the holidays good to you? Yeah, Happy New Year to you and everybody here at Gorillas Inc. and throughout the uh, country and world. How and, Santa, uh, man? Santa bring everything you asked for? Eh, you know, as we get older, that's kind of just another day, but... <laughs> He's still real to me, damn it, just like wrestling. <laughs> uh, man, I'll tell you what, we uh, this is our first show of 2022, obviously. Uh, we're bringing it in in style. We have a uh, guest with us this, this afternoon. Uh, this man has been involved in the wrestling business since the uh, late 70s, covering uh, many territories. Uh, and he is also currently the head trainer at OVW. This man has uh, had a hand in, in training some of the top names in the wrestling business. John Cena, Brock Lesnar, Randy Orton, CM Punk. Uh, this man is our guest today on Falls Count Anywhere. We, we appreciate him so much today for coming on the show. Mr. Rip Rogers, the hustler. Rip, thanks so much for joining us today, sir. Okay, whatever you fucking said, because my phone was goddamn silent the whole fucking time. So <laughs> last, last goddamn second. I left over. So oh, over. shit. Yeah, I see my research sucks today. Then I'm already off to a horrible start, but... Yeah, uh, fucked up already. <laughs> Rip, man, we appreciate your time today, man. I know your time is, is, is limited, man, but we wanted to, just to get right into it with you, man. Uh, you go way back, again, to the 70s, into the territories, into the 80s. You really uh, cut your teeth in ICW with the Poffos. What was it that got you involved in that wanted to make you get involved in the wrestling business uh, as a youngster and then coming in through the, the business there? What made you want to get into it? Well, see, I saw my first match at Seymour High School. I was seven years old. My grandpa took me to see either Dick the Bruiser against Cowboy Bob Ellis. So I remember I remember that. And then when I was in high school I said I wanna I wanna go to college, play football, then be a championship wrestler. But I was from goddamn small town Indiana and everything was K Fade. I got every fucking wrestling magazine there was. I, if they had the rabbit ears you could rotate the antenna so I could get to Indianapolis wrestling with Dick the Bruiser. I could get Jared Jarrett and fucking Nick Goulas on out of Louisville TV. And I could turn the antenna fucking east and get the Sheiks out of Cincinnati. And then late, late Saturday night, I could get Phil Golden's All-Star Wrestling out of Paducah, Kentucky. So I had, uh, had all them fucking options there. And each style was fucking different. And then you'd see the same guys on different ones, and they'd be a star on one, and a goddamn underneath guy <laughs> somewhere else. They'd be a baby face on one and a heel on the other, and it didn't get any fucking better than that. Wow, that's pretty awesome. I mean, we, we kind of had the same, uh, I guess, advantage, so to speak, here with being so close to Canada. You aim your uh, antenna the other way there, and you're picking up some Canadian channels with... Uh, uh, Lord Alfred Hayes and Billy Red Lions and those guys. So I know where you're coming from on that. Now, uh, again, you know, I had mentioned about ICW, uh, where you really got your first shot there with the Poffos. What was that experience like with uh, with the Poffos, with Randy Savage, his early days as he's developing his character? Uh, how was it working with those guys back then? Well, we were bigger than most NWA territories. At one time, we had 15 TV markets wow. that we produced. And I remember... A lot of times we had two shows on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. But I remember on on two Saturdays we had three shows going on three different fucking towns on hmm. uh, three different fucking states. Wow. So uh, usually like Angelo would run a show, he let me run a fucking show, and then sometimes Randy would run a goddamn show. Hmm. So uh, I learned about promotion. See, I lived with Randy for about four years. Okay. So I learned the fucking... Uh, our fucking uh, house is a goddamn fucking gym in there and uh, there might be a little bit of uh, cannabis smoke there not me but uh, just fucking <laughs> whatever traded at all hours of the goddamn fucking morning and then it was just uh, you wrestled every day of the year except uh, New Year's Eve and Christmas Eve wow well now you know we, we hear a lot of stories too of guys that went through the uh you know, the, the indie promotions back then, the territories, there were, there were times where, you know, you've heard stories from Mick Foley, for example, he had to sleep in his car just to go from show to show. He would just sleep in his car because he had so little time in between. Did you face that as well, where you're just kind of sleeping in the car or just doing what you could to get to the next show? I did what we want. Well, I remember one time, like, we'd go to Southern Illinois and we'd have the fucking ring, and in Miser, Mike bought by one motel room, and the record was, that was Angelo, the record was 16 guys in a room. Wow. Wow. 
That was the record. I remember I was sleeping underneath the fucking sink, and I'd wake up, and I said, I didn't spend any money, and I fucking made it. <laughs> I'm sure your back didn't appreciate it the next day, though, right? right. Well, I, was young. I was young, so it didn't goddamn matter. Bounce right off you, right? Absolutely, man. No, <laughs> we, was just, we was just tough son of bitches. Absolutely. And, and that was the norm. It was like uh, you didn't miss a fucking workout. I got in 12 contests and fucking about 16 or 18 months and one, two, clean. And every day I was fucking wrestling. That's awesome. And they didn't fucking, they didn't have no 24 hour gyms either. So you had to do whatever, just take dumbbells, learn free squats, lunges, pull ups, push up, you know what I mean? Absolutely. All, all that shit. And you just became a fucking nut and you ate goddamn clean. <laughs> Now, you were also a, uh, a tag team wrestler as well. Did you enjoy uh, being uh, involved in a tag team more than a singles wrestler? Did you have a preference? Well, as, as a single, I had total control because I learned as a heel how to lead a match. And if the match was okay, it's because the heel was good. All the baby, the baby faces shut the fuck up and listen. <laughs> and it's on the heel to make the match good or not. It's up to me to know what kind of experience, what you can do, but mostly what you could do, not have to fucking lead you like a goddamn baby. <laughs> so that's what uh, uh, Randy did with me when he was a heel and I was a goddamn baby face, <laughs> like in fucking Canada and stuff. So, but we had such good talent there. Hell, we had Randy Orton's dad, fucking Bob Roop and, and Pez and uh, uh, Bob Orton Jr., Boris Malenko, then we had our IC fucking W guys, and then we had a fucking, and we had our, and then we would knock the shit out of each other. <laughs> and, well, we basically called the other guys phony on TV because they were such pussies. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's maybe something that uh, in today's wrestling business, um, you know, I feel like the, the grind of, of back then is not what the wrestlers today really go through. I feel like it's more laid out for them. You know, you go to a training academy and then you oh, kind of... Well, know. well, well. First of all, fuck that. <laughs> Here's the thing. Mm -hmm. Now, you cannot be any good today. It's impossible. Why? You don't get... The, we worked every day. You got the reps in. We had every day in the fucking car going over fucking finishes, angles, TVs, what was right about last night, what we got to improve on. Hours in the fucking car, all the way there, all the way fucking back. Wow. You see what I mean? And I'm, and I just shut the fuck up and listen mm -hmm. because I got guys 20 years older being in the car and they've been there. So I'm picking their brain about everything. And now you got guys, oh, we got fucking this company. They work one day a week, and this one works two days a week. Mm. So they're working with guys that ain't worth a fuck. They don't look like fucking me and Rant. We was fucking in physique contest. Right. Fucking Pettis was fucking winning powerlifting contest. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And, and these guys were fucking legit. I couldn't beat my fucking grandma, but I looked like I could. <laughs> so uh, I was an entertainer before there was entertainers. But I had my first pro boxing fight when I was 40 fucking one. Don't give a fucking shit. <laughs> Ain't scared to fucking lose. And me and Randy, when we'd tag on the fucking side, we'd have to leave the fucking ring butt to butt, rotating around, uh, protecting each other because people thought it was goddamn real then. And fighting your way out was just another night, just another day. And now you got these pussy ass fucking nerds, skinny fat motherfucking. Well, we have to do our spots. Fuck your fucking spots. <laughs> Wrestling is supposed to be a fucking choreographed fight thing, not a goddamn fucking, uh, uh, holy shit, uh, exhibition or whatever. And we got fucking guys with 12 inch fucking arms throwing clotheslines. <laughs> we got guys no fuck. Oh, oh, you have to have. Fucking Dick the Bruiser wouldn't cover guys unless it was the fucking pin. You made a false pin mean something. Nobody ever just got a shoulder up unless it was the last match in the main event. That's how everything was controlled. You want them screaming at the end, not screaming at the fucking beginning. 
Yes, and we'd yes. have four matches on a two-hour goddamn show. Guys knew how to work at full fucking time and do no repeats in the goddamn fucking matches. It was fucking simple then. And now, fuck. Oh, yeah, business is fucking great. <laughs> oh, uh-huh, yeah. It embarrassed me any fuck. See, I, I don't watch... I haven't watched TV wrestling since 2002. Okay. WWE or a, The only time I see something is somebody will send me something on my phone. I refuse to watch that bullshit <laughs> in that fucking way. Fuck them. Uh, Mr. Rogers, uh, quick question. What do you think of uh, Billy Corgan trying to reboot the NWA product? It'd be like me trying to uh, reboot rock and roll and I'm a fan but I don't know nothing about it how's that <laughs> understood that's okay good analogy okay. There, that's, that's, that's all. now Billy's great in his chosen field this other everybody's a mark for something but I but I wouldn't be any good at it and you could be swerve and, and guys could talk to you and that's just like goddamn Tony Khan uh, he's a fan knows how to make money yeah uh, has a soccer club, the goddamn worst NFL football team ever. Yeah, <laughs> and he's got the fucking AEW, and 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 he can drop a billion dollars. And if I had a kid like that, I and had that money, I'd do it too. If that's what he wanted to do. <laughs> but it, but it, is it a good product? Hell no, no. Uh uh. Now, do you, do you still feel that way, Rip, when you, when you see some of the, um, you know, some of the legends come back and, and perform, like, you know, Sting, for example, still kind of, you know, Sting on bases? Sting's been on a free ride since he broke into goddamn business. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> uh, no, I ain't no fucking marks for these guys, okay? No. Uh-uh. All he's doing is stealing a fucking check. And do, you, do you feel that way about Flair, too? He's talking about wrestling one more match at 72. Well, it'd be great. He would do the same thing. Yeah. But it don't matter. It'd be what you wanted to fucking see. And to do it would be unfucking believable. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Rogers, uh, another quick question for me being the old school fan since 1980. Uh, I used to love and, and watch uh, you and Mr. Gordon Soley back in Georgia and Continental Championship Wrestling. How was yeah. Mr. Soley? He was he was uh, he was the greatest. He made you legitimate. Yeah. He, even though we was doing phony bullshit, he knew how to with that stoic face and manner. He knew how to do everything. Very cool. And you know, Rip, you know, you mentioned too, like with today's product. You know, and I, I kind of botched the opening here with your OVW days, but you know, you still got some active wrestlers that you trained. Uh, I mean, do you have any? Does that ever pull you in sometimes, though? Like, you know, Brock, uh, Brock Lesnar or, or CM Punk or any of those guys, or you, you're just kind of over it at this point? Uh, I'm over it. Yeah. Because I know what. Uh, whatever. They're just making a buck. Nothing. Nothing against them. They just half-ass do as they're told. Yeah. To the best of their fucking ability, and that's it. So. The other thing I wanted to mention too, and I, and I believe I have this correct, it, it looks like you have a, a book of pro wrestling written by Caleb Hall with lessons from Rip Rogers that's available currently on Amazon. Uh, it's a book that anybody beginning uh, would want to read because it really gives some, some serious and, and deep insight into the wrestling business. Rated 4.5 out of 5 on Amazon too, by the way. Um, you know, what was that like contributing to that book? You know, what valuable lessons somebody, say, you know, Chris here wanted to start wrestling tomorrow. You know, what's, what's something, what's a piece of advice that you could give to them? Leave it by the toilet and reread it every time you're on there. <laughs> yeah, it's broken down like so a sixth grader could understand it. That's awesome. That's awesome. Now, do you do? Do you plan on doing any, uh, you know, face-to-face -face training anymore, or are you, are you done with that? Well, I do seminars and stuff, and people come in just to train their fucking guys for a little while or whatever. Very cool. Since, since his life. Absolutely. You know. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'll always, I'll always be associated with it in some way, but just not. Uh, wrestling ain't wrestling no more. It's embarrassing. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Uh, I'm the old school fan, and uh, I barely keep up on what's going on, but uh, I'm, I'm classic old school every day in my house, and uh, it's great that uh, Adam Parsons and those guys brought back the Wrestling Legends Network on Roku, and to see you in, in all the territories is great for the classic fan. 
Well, I have no idea because fans don't know what good matches are either. Hmm. The boys don't know and the fans don't know. It's sad. Guys that know, they're all dead or they don't give a shit anymore. Huh. That's like, oh, this guy deserves a push. And, and why is that? They don't fucking know. And do you, do you feel like that's changed over the years? Like, what makes a good match? I feel like, you know, these days, you know, there's a lot of high flying, a lot of acrobats, you know, a lot of jumping off the top rope going on in today's wrestling as opposed to back in the day. Um, do you feel like that's kind of maybe taken away a little bit from from the sport, or is it just the evolution and it was just inevitable? No, it, evolution is fucking guys change because they don't know what to fucking do. Everybody just does copycat shit. Hmm. Here's the whole thing. Do a goddamn dive miss it that's the fucking finish and they carry him out yeah hit a fucking dive that's the fucking finish get the guy in the ring he's fucking helpless and pinny now you have no more dives the rest of the fucking match yeah pretty fucking simple whatever anybody else does don't fucking don't do it or have a different out fucking come story fucking tell damn straight i agree with that 100 percent. you know um and that's the thing the you know the wrestling business to, to me has changed i i like chris here watched it since the 80s and to me you know the the old school days of like the the big guys the big john studs the andre the giants the bundies you know those types of guys they've kind of transitioned away to the smaller guys where i i kind of agree with you here with you know, I see a guy like Adam Cole, uh, for example. He's not a very big guy, and it's hard for me to take him serious sometimes when he's getting mad in the ring. It's like, well, you're not really even that big. I mean, I know it's not all about size, but I feel like that's a huge uh, part of it. Well, he weighs probably 165. Yeah. And that's, I think I weigh more than him. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, definitely has uh, evolved into the smaller guy, as you said. I, I kind of appreciate the bigger guys back then, especially the athletic big guys. And you still see him these days. Omos with WWE is one of a newer newer talent. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I feel like the old school is where it was at as far as uh, competition. The bigger wrestlers made it more, uh, for lack of a better term, made it more believable. Yeah. Well such as life absolutely <laughs> well rip um listen man i know your time is precious today we we thank you so much for joining us this is a a new podcast for us we're only about six episodes in so for okay. for you to come in and, and and join us man it's an honor and a privilege for us we thank you so much for your time today sir yes thank right. you take a little ass have a good day boys absolutely you too rip take care man all right, that was the, uh, the colorful Rip Rogers. As you can see, um, Rip doesn't hold back, man. He's going to give you his opinion, and, uh, you know, he's, he's going to tell you without sugarcoating, and I love that. Uh, we're going to take a quick sure. break here uh, on Falls County. Anywhere. We're going to take a quick commercial break, and we'll, uh, we'll be right back.
All right, welcome back, folks. Falls Con Anywhere podcast. Charlie Turner here with Chris DiCarlo. Chris, maybe we just wrapped up that interview with Rip, Rip Rogers. Um, he doesn't hold back, man. He just kind of lets it all, all out, man. I love that. It's uh, it was an unfiltered uh, interview from Rip. It was so cool to hear from him and uh, his opinions on today's wrestling. Uh, some stories from back in the day as and well. And an insight into the business. Absolutely, man. And, uh, yeah, like I said, there's no sugarcoating with Rip, man. We love that. We absolutely love that. So, again, thank you to Rip Rogers for joining us today. And, of course, uh, as we transition every week, uh, we just can't really uh, complete a show without uh, thoughts from the Iron Sheik. And, uh, you know, uh, this whole Omicron or Omicron variant, it sucks, right? This whole COVID-19 thing. And... Um, so of course the sheik was asked the question, um, you know, name the COVID variant and uh, fifty bucks oh. to the funniest, fifty bucks to the wow. most likes. The Hulkster Crown is what uh, <laughs> the sheik w- went with. Who there. else would have thought of that? Yeah, and I, I, I like that. That works for me. The Hulkster Crown, you know, um, that's a variant that uh, we're gonna have to put in the camel clutch, there, brother. Wow, just yeah. bitter since nineteen eighty four. Wow, it's great. It's great. I love that he keeps the fire going, man. After all these years. Um, and then, of course, the, the sheet continues on uh, to where, you know, Roger Clemens, uh, former New York Yankee great. I'm a big Yankee fan, more, former Boston Red Boston Sox. Yeah, that's all right. Um, but anyway, um, you know, he wants to get more involved in social media. So he pushed out a tweet saying, I want to get more involved. Can anybody out there help me? You know, I, I appreciate the help. Of course, Darren Sheik wants to uh, offer some assistance to Roger Clemens. He said, Roger Bubba, welcome to the biggest jabroni app on earth. Uh, If anybody fuck with you, let me know and I'll break their fucking neck. Have a good day. You know, if I had the capability of breaking necks on behalf of Roger Clemens, I would do it too. But uh, at least the Sheik has his back and I appreciate that, man. Wow, that's cool of the Sheik. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and we love Roger Clemens, man. Um, And of course, uh, he led the Yankees to some World Series. We'll get into that maybe on John's show sometime. And of course, um, you know, the final thought from the Sheik is the fate of our future is in the hand of fucking jabronis, man. Now, let me tell you something. The older I get, the more I follow politics and I, I, you know, watch some of these news channels and go online and listen to this stuff, whatever. The Sheik is absolutely right. The future of this, this, our future, period. We're we're screwed, man. It's in the hand of of a bunch of jabronis. I think me and you could run the government better than what's being ran or... That's you for know, sure. Let's start making some calls, man. You know, let's see if we can get some influence. John, I know you got some pull. Oh. We could, uh, maybe we can start turning things around. <laughs> but anyway, the Sheik's had it, man. And he said the, the future uh, is in the hands of jabronis. And um, I couldn't agree more, man. This world has changed uh, since we were younger. You know, even within the past 20 years, uh, as we discussed off the air with all the social media crap and Snapchats and TikToks. And you can't keep track of everything. And I feel like the world's going down a a swirl into the toilet but that's all right uh we uh we always count on the sheik to provide us some uh some positive thinking and motivation which is what he's done for me today and then um and as we of course transition to the library of mr uh, christopher de carlo here uh you've unleashed the library on us again chris we have some uh classic wrestling clips we're every bring week up here. here yes all clips are courtesy of my personal library as we say uh each and every show here and uh, these range from 1982 to 84. Uh, we'll check out this first one here uh, with. Oh man, we're, we're, we're rocking with that music in the background. We got uh, some legendary clips out of the uh, library of Chris DiCarlo here. This is. Uh, Georgia Championship Wrestling, it looks like, right, Chris? Yes, this is uh, Georgia, 1982. John, uh, the mass superstar, and his feud with Mr. Wrestling number two here. Yeah, we'll see in a minute. <laughs> Mr. Yeah. Wrestling number one. Well, you know what, what really, I think uh, Mr. Wrestling number two here got so uh, pissed off, shall we say, at this angle? is because his wife made the robes for him and Flair back in the day. So for now, the was super... she the one that did the handmade uh, robes yes. back then? Okay. Yes. For, yeah. for the mass superstar to do this as an angle, he knew it would probably really piss off Mr. Wrestling number two. <laughs> the robes are unreal. Purple, blue, you know what I mean? Oh, with the like with the pearl, not yes. the pearls, but like the rubies and stuff, yeah. or whatever, like the fake rubies and stuff, the and red, the it's blue, just, yeah, all handmade and expensive, and they came out amazing. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh. There we go. To take somebody's oh. oh. Let me tell you something. Superstar, let me tell you something. Yeah, that really ticked him off. This is one time, pal. You overstepped yourself. There's a lot of guys in line to wrestle you. But let me tell you, I'm no two anymore. I'm one, pal. Uh -huh, there we go. I'm number one. And everybody, anywhere, is going to have to follow me. Scared me. Because you're mine. I got you. I've got you in a match, pal. One you can't escape from me. Your mind, your body, and your soul yeah, is mine. Yeah, that's because the, yeah, he was genuinely pissed. Door. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> here, here we go. A classic angle again. 1982 Georgia Championship Wrestling. Mr. Uh, Morocco going off on Gordon Soli. Yeah. Yeah. This kind of reminds me of the uh, Patterson Koloff slap angle. We're going to hear that in about a minute here. Bang! Oh. What a crack to Piper. And then he goes after Soli, <laughs> threatening Soli. Oh, and there we go. Piper comes. Once again, man, those studio brawls. There's just something about that studio wrestling. You know, it's just the chaos looks more intense. Love it. Yeah, it reminds me of the old uh, Pikachu in uh, the bowling. That's just reminds me of like, <laughs> yeah. Hal just breaks into bowling. <laughs> <laughs> Bowling for dollars. Yeah. <laughs> right, so limited, right? Yeah. yeah. And you know that was actually the same WTBS studio that they used in the late '80s with uh, NWA World Championship Wrestling with Mr. Crockett and Shivani. Now, was that for also used for WCW Saturday Night or no? Or was um, that a different studio. They used the studio up till '89. Uh, in 89, then 89 okay. they transferred into... Oh, they went to uh, Disney, right? Didn't they go to Disney Orlando for uh, uh, Saturday no, before night? before that, they stayed uh, Atlanta. In, even to this day, the NWA is, 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 is in Atlanta. Sometimes irrational. Uh, in our social structure, uh, he uh, appears to want to set up his own set the of Dean rules. The Dean Gordon Soli, one and only. He wants to be an island unto himself. Uh, whether or not he'll uh, succeed at that, I don't uh, know, but I'll tell you... Wow. Very poetic. Yeah. Time. Now, Let's now, go back in time up. now and take a look uh, at what we right? saw. Yes, we're going to go right here. A classic Again, angle, John. We've talked about this, and here we, we go. Yeah. Uh, this is Black pretty blasty. Vince McMahon and Blackjack right, Mulligan here. Now. Yep, where are you going to see uh, There's the big giant. Andre cleaning house. Oh, and there goes Albano. Andre is this one scary individual. I mean, fall backwards. It's like the dramatic of the bump. Uh, that's Mr. Saito and Andre Scott. Oh, and here he comes, Big Black Jack Mulligan. Yep. Bang. Takes the chair to the giant's back. And then he's going to go with his famous claw hold to the giant's head. But as we talked, guys, back in the day, uh, early 80s, uh, I don't know if it was WWOR or just wrestling in general, the TV studios would put that big red X on so that nobody would see the blood gushing from their heads. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I remember that on that Mulligan maybe against the stud. Yeah, we're oh, are they pop it up here? Is it yeah. up here? Okay. And, uh, within our, our other clips here too, we're gonna see. Uh, yeah. Stumbling around. Blood. There we go. There we go. <laughs> there was the X back in the day here, 1982. Classic. Classic. 
Yes, to heal. He played to heal more than he played to face. But man, big Andre, man. It's fun to watch Andre work, though. And I know this clip, the sound was kind of in and out. But uh, again, 1982, still, you know, it, footage was what what it was. And uh, here we got the angle that was uh, Captain Lou Albano was managing Snooker, and then that kind of fell apart and. Uh, Snooka here's in the ring against Ray the Crippler Stevens. Amazing. You know what I mean? This takes a lot of you know, Yeah. You know, has some guts to go up. Yeah. And then all hell's going to break loose in and around the squared circle there in the old uh, Allentown PA Fieldhouse WWF. Ah, that's uh, right around where PPW does their, their work these days, Allentown. Mm. Oh, here we go. You can see, John, did you uh, see this clip as the ring announcer, Joe McCune, kind of cuts what he was doing. He knew kind of what was coming. Right. Oh, there, oh, he, there goes. he goes. Yeah, he knew it was going to get ugly in there. I miss the old school managers, man. We don't see this anymore. Yeah. Oh, no, no, there goes. Look at him. His arms are flailing. <laughs> and what about the rubber bands around the beard? Yeah, yeah oh yeah. And, and, the and he pins. had the piercing oh, the in his cheek in his or whatever, face. didn't he? Yeah. Oh. You can see Albano, a bunch of Albanos, like at Pico Mellos or something at any time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that looked like Captain Lou. There he is. Um, yeah. Look at him. The manager of Tag Team Champions, I guess he was more famous for. Yeah. But here we go. Yes, the Moon Dogs, the Samoans. Fuji Saido, yeah, Blassie's getting involved here with uh, Stevens. And his old looks like old Tampa Bay Buccaneer colors. So <laughs> but let's go back in the day. Remember John 19? Oh, oh, there's the first pile driver to the concrete oh, onto floor. The concrete oh, look again. What's going on. Again, there's no mats back then, man. It's just yes. straight concrete, nope. you know. Proud. It's awesome. Just now, was Look this uh, part of the era? Because I noticed in some of these old clips, there's no guardrails around the first row. I don't know if this one does no, or not. No, yeah, the guardrails did not come into play until uh, 83. Wow, okay. So, but, uh, can you imagine fact, that in 2021 there'd be, or 2022, I should say? There'd be no yeah, way. see the guardrails here. This is, there we go. Uh, okay. oh, we got a new one here, yeah. This is May 83, Allentown, but they got the guardrails up and, and more crowd in. And this is Slaughter. And this is uh, Sergeant Slaughter. Returning to the WWF and starting and full GI Joe gear there goes right after an angle with the Den champion uh, Bob Backlund. Right, Backlund was doing the Starver, uh, Starver, uh, the, step up the step test. Yeah, and oh. Slaughter just whipping yeah. Backlund oh, with man. that riding crop. Yeah, he's just a Slaughter classic. Yes. And there goes the Bang. best jaw in wrestling history, Sergeant and Slaughter. Of course, Bagman yes. being like the private or whatever you want to, whatever you want, <laughs> yeah. you know. He, well, he'll tell you later on when we see back when he likes this clip. Oh, uh, right across the face with the. Geez. Man, would it be great to get Mr. Backlund on the show sometime? <laughs> wow. I want to get him in studio. I want, to, I want him to put somebody in the crossface chicken wing, man. That's oh, what I want. I'm sure it would happen if these guys come in. <laughs> I, I have a feeling that all hell would break loose in there. <laughs> Oh, there you go. Look at this. Gorilla's ink would be torn apart. Yeah. 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 How about the four? <laughs> it would be worth it. Yeah, it'd be worth it, though. It would be the first <laughs> all break <laughs> situation. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, so there, look at Slaughter. He's... The classic angles back in the day. I mean, you don't even see that now. Is that right. the Grand Wizard of Wrestling? Yes, it there was. It the Grand that. Wizard of Wrestling, huh? Ernie <laughs> Roth. He was great. Yeah. I always liked him. Yeah, I, I put him up there. And... Oh, back now. I put him up there in the top five, at least out of all the territories and managers we got, we had. He really got some beating here with the whip. Yeah, I mean, it, it was probably a, a setup angle. Oh, yeah, here we go. Listen to this. His interviews were very disturbing to me. I, I don't know what to say about Backlund with the interview. What, I don't know. Weird and just... I mean, I guess that's a good thing, though. Yeah. I mean, that's what you want. But... <laughs> Oh, he was man. building into the feud, the uh, small feud at the time. You know, like Backlink took a beating and then he's going to come back and kick your butt. Right, yeah. 
which it kind of always happens that way. In professional wrestling. And I'm not a subscriber. Top five of all time. Back one. Jeez. For sure. I mean, he's unbelievable. Oh, yeah. He's just going to Really, a yeah. longest. Uh, uh oh, here we go, Charlie. All right, well, what clip we got here? Oh, we got the super fly. You gotta remember this one. And now you send this. Morocco Snuka start of their angle and feud, 1983. Oh, yeah. yeah. Morocco said something to Snuka. I still don't even know what that yeah. was said, but Snuka just irate here. Carrying apart Morocco <laughs> outside of the ring there. Shaming him or whatever they say. <laughs> The Superfly is easily uh, a fan favorite from back then. Um, and of course, the fan favorite. And I remember him uh, teaming up with uh, Andre the Giant at, at some points back then. Yes, 82, he 84. He would jump off his shoulders. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and then the... Oh, here we go. Man. We're going to see another red X, I believe, John. Right. Where, uh, We're going to see some blood. Because Morocco grabbed the mic and clobbered Snuka over the head with it. So Snuka will start to... Yeah, what a feud this was over the years from 83 on, I think, until 93, I believe. This is always the best part, I thought, when the guys would come off in the back. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. There we go. Yeah. The red censored X. Yeah. Famous in the 80s, especially yeah. with WWF. Not Absolutely. so much. And I believe they used it up until uh, right around when, when uh, Jake the Snake, when Damien was biting uh, the yes. Macho Man on the yes. rope, I believe they, they used it. did do that back in 92. One of the last times they used it. Yes, you are correct. Yeah, probably the blood just dripping down. <laughs> and you know, it's so funny too because this is all obviously before social media. Back in the day, this wouldn't have mattered. You could put a red X up. But somebody was going to find that raw footage. Right. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I don't know. No. I definitely don't have that footage. <laughs> no. Well, there weren't too many iPhones in the crowd that day either. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. But and McMahon just calling all those angles, huh, John? Yeah. He's the best. It was his best. He yeah. loved him on the microphone. Wow, was he great. Now, yeah. now coming up, you know, this is the oh. oh, Andre yeah. gets a haircut. Can never get enough of the giant, man. This, I, you know. this is the classic <laughs> angle. Please listen to me, man. I, the what he says here is so funny. I was When I was, you know, during production going through this, yeah. I, could, I was laughing in tears because the things, the dramatic screaming is... And Bruno, Bruno yeah. San Martino commenting. Yes. Oh, okay. At first I thought it was Patterson. Wow. Right? Yes. Yeah, no, it was Bruno. This was uh, near the end of 84. John Studd is a monster, too. Another uh, legend. Yeah, Big John Studd. Absolutely. Yeah. Ken Patera's still around. Yeah, oh, yeah. Was he an Olympian? Is that the thing with him or no? Or they just used yes. to try to say it? Oh, yes. Yeah. And a strong man competition. Like him and uh, Tony Atlas. They, it's like him and Atlas always went at it. Uh, Mid Atlantic and then here, WWF. Gosh, speaking of Atlas, there was a match with Ted Arcidi that was just absolutely brutal. If you're, if oh, yes. Never seen it. That was just. 85, uh, 86. It went into, it spilled into the crowd. Some kid got hurt. We wow. should bring that one up if you have it uh, for next week or whatever. Uh, uh, yeah. Of course, within the top five, John, Bobby the Brain Heenan. Oh, yeah. Sure. To me, he's number one. I think he's the best manager of all time. The Brain. Oh, uh, humiliation. <laughs> Degrading the giant. Raping his Yes. I laughed so hard. When I, <laughs> that's where I lost. I almost fell out of it. <laughs> <laughs> then of course in the crazy world of wrestling uh, Stud would team up with Andre and Bundy at one point there it is McMahon raping the dignity of the giant yes. which is kind of yeah. true at the time I mean <laughs> yeah. it's just, who when McMahon says it though I think he realized at the time this is what I'm you know really yeah. you know, but it's great right Early McMahon's okay. Mid '90s McMahon was kind of getting yeah '96, '97 McMahon. Yeah, uh, bringing in Jim Ross at that point was a great move. 
but then uh, Bret well, Hart. Before uh, that, but he was he transitioned to Bret Hart kind of helped. Yeah. Break that barrier. Yeah. Let's say between the kayfabe and real. I, uh, McMahon was saying, yeah, the '80s McMahon is maybe the best. I, I don't know much better as, at, at the ringside. I mean, it's yeah. unbelievable. He's had some um, some legendary interviews. You know, where the, you know a lot of these interviews. And I feel like Andre's involved in a lot of those. A lot of yeah. his legendary interviews. Um, yeah, very cool stuff, Chris. I mean, yeah, um, thank you. It's awesome. Said, man, keep unloading the library, man. Um, if we get that Tedder CD, <laughs> let me tell you something, I'll, man. I'll I brought uh, that up because it, for you. it was one of the worst matches I've ever seen. And when it spilled out into the crowd, um, there was a first row of seats, and back then it was all the metal chairs all connected together. And the first row just absolutely collapsed into some kid sitting into the second row. And the kid, uh -huh. you could see him, he's probably about 14 years old or something like that. He's crying. He's like, my leg, my leg. The chair is like leaning on his oh, leg. Wow. And these guys are both like 300 pounds each and are oh, leaning into this oh, kid. Yeah, It was absolutely brutal. And I, I looked up, I did a little, we could talk about it once, if we could get the clip of uh, one of these shows. But both guys lasted less than maybe 90 days after that before they were released okay. ultimately. And uh, McMahon had no use for him. So yeah. Oh yeah, because that had to be a... Uh serious issue it must have been concern Back oh then. of course yes. yeah and then you think about if that would have happened Liability. in today's wrestling like i said with phones everywhere uh geez there'd be lawsuits be up and down and yeah all kinds of controversy with that spilling into the crowd like that that was very interesting but uh, again though chris thanks for those clips man seeing andre get a haircut <laughs> man yeah, it's just one of those classic angles right yeah. absolutely absolutely and of course uh, as we we wrap up every show as we do here on falls count anywhere uh it's never complete without two things it's a chic tweet and uh, our jobber of the week. And uh, our jobber this week, uh, another glorified jobber, if you will, Mr. Dwayne Gill. Uh, he's wrestled under uh, many different um, wrestling names, where, including Gilberg, if anybody remembers that. Uh, he come out probably with made the sparklers him as opposed to the uh, pyrotechnics. And, yeah. Yeah, so Dwayne Gill. Uh, now, also, now Dwayne Gill, his career record in WWF was 10 wins, one uh, draw, and 114 losses. Pretty bad, right? But wow. uh, he does have some notable victories. He also has a title run. He uh, he won yeah, a match yeah. against Goldust on uh, Raw, uh, Monday Night Raw in 1999. Also, um, on Saturday Night Heat, more notably, he defeated uh, Matt Hardy and won the uh, WWF lightweight title and went on a 448-day run as the lightweight champion. Now, wow. in fairness, though, the lightweight title wasn't always defended every week, and people kind of forgot about it. But, hey, as far as jobbers go, Dwayne Gill, man. Um, now, we had that picture of him in a uh, one of the, probably the worst gimmick to never happen, and thank God it didn't. Uh, but he was part of a tag team known as the Toxic Turtles. And that's okay if you, oh, if you can't yes. get to it, Wade, but... Man, they basically him and uh, it was Barry Hardy. I don't know if he's related to Matt or, or Jeff. I don't think so. But there it was him are. and oh, Barry Hardy. There, there they go. go. The Toxic Turtles lasted uh, maybe a week <laughs> before that was canceled. Yeah. Um, just an absolutely horrible gimmick because obviously these guys look exactly like Ninja Turtles. Yeah, yeah McMahon and his... Uh, I, know, right? <laughs> I mean, look, McMahon did this to Dwayne Gill for competition against wcw and uh Goldberg right at the time. So, i mean I, you know in some of the the gimmicks down you know from throughout the years duke the dumpster drossy and skinner and you know he used to chew tobacco so and i feel like the toxic turtles were kind of along those lines of completely cheesy and, and terrible gimmicks but again that one i think only lasted through maybe a couple dark matches uh the toxic turtles and never made it to actual tv which is a good thing uh, yes. But Dwayne Gill, uh, still going strong. He was born back in uh, July 9th of 1959. Uh, he His real name is uh, Dwayne Gill, so there's no uh, messing around there. And um, he was uh, he, he hails out of Glen Burnie's uh, Maryland. And, uh, of course, he's no longer active. The most recent he was seen was on WWE TV. Uh, within the last 10 years, I believe he wrestled a match with Triple H. And uh, they, you know, Triple H kind of roughed him up and sent him on his way. But uh, yeah. Dwayne Gill, uh, this week's jobber, and um, you know, again, it just kind of makes the show feel complete when we uh, wrap it up with the jobber of the week because that's what we are. We're a couple of jobbers, right? Yeah. Uh, and I'm still wearing headphones. See what I mean? Yeah. So um, yeah. So yeah, this was awesome, man. Come back here in the 2022. Oh, we got friend. plenty of shout-outs. Don't worry, I'm not wrapping it up yet. 
Uh, Go ahead, Chris. Shout out to our friend uh, Sean Kramars out there and all his independent promotions. Yes, and, uh, Daddy Yeah Productions. Uh, we want to yes. give that a shout. You can find them on Facebook and I believe on Twitter as well. Daddy Yeah Productions. Uh, Kramar is pretty much is the uh, the brains behind all, all that. And I know he's uh, deeply involved with Daddy Yeah. So check that out because Sean's one of our good buddies here on the show. Yes, indeed. Also, I want to give a uh, quick shout out to my niece. Uh, Miranda has celebrated her uh, 17th birthday yesterday. So happy birthday happy to Miranda. Happy birthday. Um, and uh, do we have any updates as far as um, uh, to Paulo, as far as oh. the uh, the kidney replacement? If we don't have anything set up, I well, apologize. But no, we, talk, we always want to get that out there. We talked to her on Monday. We're trying to keep in touch with her every Monday. Um, yes. She's still on the search. Still looking, um, okay. And there's... Uh, See, they won't tell her much because I guess HIPAA stuff, they don't ever tell her anything. I see. But, um, you know, it's another, like she had said, it's another day without dialysis. So she's happy for that. That's good. And um, had a great holiday, she said. Good. Uh, one of the most positive people we've ever met for someone who's had such tough times. Yeah. Really. yeah. And, um, Hopefully in 2022, you know. She's tough, man. She's yeah. a warrior. So, she, yeah, we're still searching and we're going to still keep the word out there. Good. Very yeah. good. And we'll we'll be sure to keep sharing that and uh, hope for the best there for uh Elena DePaolo and, and her family, of course. Yes, uh, we'll we'd like uh, everybody to check out Gorilla Zinc and our store and uh, T-shirts, and cards, everything for sale here. And uh, yeah, man, go buy some merchandise. Go buy some uh, some basketball cards or some football cards on there. Uh, I know I've mentioned it because one of my all-time favorite players, Larry Bird, there's a Larry Bird card available there. Um, talk about a guy that would uh, eat you alive and talk trash. Larry Bird would have made a hell of a wrestler, wouldn't he? <laughs> At least in my opinion. I don't know. The hick from French Lick. Right. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, man, you know, again, guys, thank you so much for Robin, for Wade, behind the scenes here with us. John, thanks for joining us today. And, again, thank you. And, Chris, of course, thank you, the co-host here on False Cut Anywhere. And, of course, to uh, Rip Rogers yes. uh, for joining us today on our, on our humble little show here in our little studio. Uh, we appreciate Rip very much for – being as candid and as open as he was, man, we, we welcome that here, and uh, we would love to have him back again. Uh, so for everybody here at Gorilla Zinc, thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you next time.